Madam President. Senator from Vermont. Before I go to the substance of my remarks, let me just say what I think is on the minds of millions of Americans today, whether they're progressives or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans or independents, and that the United States of America is not and must never be about locking up little children in cages on the southern border. And right now, we have the opportunity and must take advantage of that opportunity to pass legislation to end that horrific practice. Madam President, um, I want to take uh, this moment to thank my colleagues uh, for their very hard work on the Department of Defense uh, authorization bill. Unfortunately, for a number of reasons, which I will articulate right now, I intend to vote against it. Uh, and certainly one of those reasons is that when you have legislation that expends $716 billion, let me repeat it, $716 billion, uh, it is totally unacceptable that we do not have a serious debate on the floor of the Senate, that amendments are not accepted to improve this legislation. Now, I had submitted a number of amendments. Other colleagues I know have done the same. But I do want to express my strong feelings about our nation's bloated military budget particularly in light of the many unmet needs we face as a nation. A $716 billion military budget is over half of the discretionary budget in this country. And the size of that budget tells me that we need vigorous debate on it. We need to find where there is waste, where there is, for, where there is fraud, where there are cost overruns, and to simply pass that gigantic budget without scrutiny is simply not acceptable. You know, Madam President, I have heard over and over again my Republican colleagues and some of my Democratic colleagues come down here to the floor to complain about a $21 trillion national debt. And they're right. That is a huge debt that we are leaving to our children and our grandchildren. But I do find it interesting that I do not hear any objections to the size of this military budget to the fact that it has been expanded by $165 billion over the next two years. So what I do find is that when we talk about providing health care to all of our people and doing what every other major nation on earth does, guarantee health care as a right and not a privilege, suddenly people are standing up and saying, we can't afford it, it's too expensive. But when it comes to a $716 billion military budget, which is more than the 10 next countries combined spend on defense, I do not hear a word about the size of the budget and about our deficit. Madam President, we have been told over and over again that we cannot make public colleges and universities tuition free, that we cannot lower the student debt levels that millions of people in this country carry decade after decade. We cannot make public colleges and universities tuition free, but somehow we can spend $716 billion on a military budget even though over half of older Americans have no retirement savings, we have been told that we need to cut Social Security, not expand Social Security. 
So, Madam President, I think it's time to get our priorities right. And what our priorities are about is addressing the fact that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country, that we got millions of seniors in Vermont and around this country trying to get by in $11,000, $13,000 a year Social Security, that our infrastructure is collapsing. Maybe we might want to start addressing the issues and the needs of the working people of this country rather than just pour more and more money into the defense budget. Madam President, the time is long overdue for us to take a hard look at the enormous, and I underline the word enormous, amount of waste, at the cost overruns, at the fraud, and at the financial mismanagement that has plagued the Department of Defense for decades. And that is why I have offered along a bipartisan amendment along with Senators Grassley and Lee to end the absurdity of the Department of Defense being the only federal agency that has not undergone an audit. I don't think it is too much to ask when we're spending $716 billion to have the Department of Defense give us an audit. Tell the American people how that money is being spent. Tell us about the fraud. Tell us about the cost overruns. Madam President, according to a Gallup poll a few months ago, 65 percent of the American people oppose spending more money on the Department of Defense. But that is precisely what we are doing right now, not only spending more money, spending a lot more money. Mr. Pre Madam President, as a point of comparison, and it's important that we do this, the increase, the increase in military spending that is in this bill is larger than the entire budget of China. I'm just talking about the increase in military spending. China spends about $150 billion a year on defense. We are going to be increasing military spending by $165 billion over a two-year period. Russia spends about $61 billion a year on defense. This budget, again, $716 billion. Now, I am sure our friends in the defense contractor industry are very, very excited about this. They're going to be making zillions of dollars. But I am not so sure that working people are excited about a budget at the same time as my Republican friends tell us we cannot afford nutrition programs for children or expanding Social Security for the elderly. Madam President, I think we all believe in a strong national defense, but we cannot continue to give the Pentagon and defense contractors like Lockheed Martin a blank check while we ignore the needs of working families. Madam President, about half of the Pentagon's $716 billion budget goes directly into the hands of private contractors, not our troops. There are troops out there who are living on food stamps. We want to address that problem. But at the same time, we do not have to make the military industrial complex even wealthier than they are today. And let us also be clear, over the past two decades, virtually every major defense contractor in the United States has paid millions of dollars in fines and settlements for misconduct and fraud, all while making huge profits on these government contracts. Since 1995, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and United Technologies have paid nearly $3 billion in fines or related settlements for fraud or misconduct. $3 billion in payments to the government for fraud or misconduct. Yet those three co companies alone received about $800 billion in defense contracts 
over the past 18 years. Does anybody care that the major defense contractors in this country time after time after time are found guilty of fraud and various types of misconduct? One of the amendments that I have filed would simply require the Pentagon to establish a website on defense contractor fraud with a list of companies convicted of defrauding the federal government. I don't think that that is a radical idea. The American people might want to know what companies have been found guilty of defrauding the federal government. Further, Madam President, I find it interesting that the very same defense contractors that have been found guilty or reach settlements for fraud are also paying their CEOs and their executives excessive and obscene compensation packages. Last year, the CEOs of Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, two of the top four U.S. defense contractors, were each paid over $20 million in total compensation. Moreover, more than 90 percent of the revenue from those companies came from defense spending. In other words, we have a situation where companies that get almost all of their revenue from defense contracting are paying their CEOs a hundred times more than the Secretary of Defense gets, whose salary is capped at $205,000 a year. That, to me, makes no sense at all. And that is why, Madam President, I have filed an amendment to prohibit defense contractor CEOs from making more money than the Secretary of Defense. Moreover, Madam President, as the GAO has told us, there are massive cost overruns in the Defense Department's acquisition budget that must be addressed. According to the GAO, the Pentagon's $1.66 trillion acquisition portfolio currently suffers from more than $537 billion in cost overruns, with much of the cost growth taking place after production. In other words, defense contractors say we're going to build a weapon system for X amount of dollars, and then they simply change their mind and ask for a lot more. That is not the way you protect taxpayers' dollars or the way you run a government. In my view, that has got to change. Madam President, let me repeat a major reason why there is so much waste, fraud, and abuse at the Pentagon is the fact that the Defense Department remains the only federal agency in America that has not been able to pass an independent audit 28 years after Congress required it to do so. Very interestingly, on September 10, 2001, one day before 9-11, former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said, and I quote, this was George Bush's Secretary of Defense, quote, our financial systems are decades old. According to some estimates, this is Rumsfeld, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions we cannot share information from floor to floor in the Pentagon because it's stored on dozens of technological systems that are inaccessible or incompatible, end of quote. And yet, 17 years after Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld's statements, DOD has still not passed a clean audit despite the fact that the Pentagon controls assets in excess of $2.2 trillion dollars or roughly 70 percent of what the entire federal government owns. Madam President, the Commission on Wartime Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan concluded in 2001 that 31 to $60 billion spent in Iraq and Afghanistan had been lost to fraud and waste. Children in America go hungry Veterans sleep out on the street. Elderly people can't make it on $12,000 a year Social Security. But apparently there is not a lot of concern 
that $31 to $60 billion spent in Iraq and Afghanistan have been lost to fraud and waste. Separately, in 2015, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction reported that the Pentagon could not account for $45 billion in funding for reconstruction projects. And more recently, an audit conducted by Ernst & Young for the Defense Logistics Agency found that it could not properly account for some $800 million in construction projects. Madam President, it is time to hold the Defense Department to the same level of accountability as the rest of the government. I would also like to spend a minute talking about an amendment that to me makes a great deal of sense. In this bill, we are spending $716 billion in defense spending in order to protect the American people. And this bill does that through the production of planes and bombs and guns and missiles and tanks, nuclear weapons, submarines, and you name the weapon of destruction, it is being funded in this bill. The amendment that I am proposing would reduce the Defense Department by all of one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent, and use that money to make us safer by reaching out to people throughout the world in ways that bring us together through educational and cultural exchange programs. At the end of the day, we are a safer country and a safer planet when we do our best to rid the ignorance and hatred which exist all over the world. And one way you do that is by finding and discovering that we have a common humanity and that when children from other countries come into our classrooms and our kids sit in the classrooms of other countries, it turns out that we have a lot more in common than we have in opposition, and that we can reduce hatred and bigotry in that way. Dialogue cannot only take place between foreign ministers or diplomats at the United Nations. It should be taking place between people throughout the world at the grassroots level. Now, Madam President, on a separate note, let me mention that since March of 2015, the United States Armed Forces have been involved in hostilities between a Saudi-led coalition and the Houthis in Yemen. I believe that the time is long overdue for us to put an end to that unconstitutional and unauthorized participation in this war. The truth about Yemen is that U.S. forces have been actively engaged in support of the Saudi coalition in this war, providing intelligence and aerial refueling of planes whose bombs have killed thousands of people and made the humanitarian crisis there even worse. Even now, as I speak, there are reports of an attack on the Yemeni port city of Hodeidah by the Saudi-led coalition. Hodeidah is a key entry point for humanitarian aid into Yemen. The UN humanitarian coordinator in the country, Lisa Grant, said last week that, quote, a military attack or siege on Hudaydah will impact hundreds of thousands of innocent civili civilians. In a prolonged worst case, we fear that as many as 250,000 people may lose everything, even their lives." End of quote. The Trump administration has tried to justify our involvement in the Yemen war as necessary 
to push back on Iran. Well, you will all recall that another administration told us that invading Iraq was necessary to confront al-Qaeda, and another administration way back told us the Vietnam War was necessary to contain communism. Turned out that in every instance, none of that was true. We should have asked tougher questions then, and we should be asking tougher questions now, and we should be taking our constitutional role more seriously. The issue of going to war is not a presidential prerogative. It is the prerogative of the United States Congress. We have now been in Afghanistan for nearly 17 years, in Iraq for 15 years. Our troops are now in Syria under what I believe are questionable authorities, and the administration has indicated that it may broaden that mission even more. The time is now for Congress to reassert its constitutional role in determining when and where our country goes to war. And that is why I have filed a bipartisan amendment along with Senators Lee, Murphy, Warren, and several others that would put an end to the U.S. refueling of Saudi-led coalition planes. This amendment will send a strong message that the United States will no longer participate in this humanitarian catastrophe. Directly related to the conflict in Yemen is the issue of Iran. The Trump administration has repeatedly justified its support for the Saudi Emirati war in terms of pushing back on Iran's activities. The Trump administration has signaled in many ways that it intends to confront Iran and if anyone has any doubt, I would remind them that President Trump's new national security advisor, John Bolton, wrote an article a few years ago that was titled, To Stop Iran's Bomb, Bomb Iran, end of quote. I have very serious concerns about this that this administration could lead the United States into another major war in the Middle East, which is the last thing that the American people want. Madam President, let me conclude uh, by saying this. I think that everybody in the Congress believes and understands that we need a strong defense. But we do not need a defense budget that is bloated, that is wasteful, and that has in it many areas of fraud. I would hope that all of my colleagues remembered what a former Republican President Dwight David Eisenhower said as he left office in 1961. This is what President Eisenhower said as he was leaving office. Quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist." End of quote. And in an earlier speech, Eisenhower, a four-star general who led American forces in World War II, not exactly a pacifist, what Eisenhower said in an earlier speech, and I quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are clothed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron." End of quote. I would ask all of my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, to remember what President Eisenhower said. Therefore, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the following amendments be considered and agreed to on block. 
Sanders Amendment Number 2905 regarding the DOD audit, Amendment 2657 regarding a citizen exchange program, Amendment Number 2660 regarding Saudi refueling, and Amendment Number 2506 regarding defense contractor compensation. Is there objection? Serving the right.